This is Stephen Todman, pediatric cardiologist at LSU in Shreveport, and today we will be going over pediatric hypertension. So what does the American Board of Pediatrics require you to know about blood pressure? You're going to need to understand when to screen for an increased blood pressure and what to do with the results, and you're going to need to understand the appropriate technique, including appropriate cuff size for measuring blood pressure. So much of what we're going to be going over today is from the fourth report on the diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of high blood pressure in children and adolescents. So we're going to go through this report basically so that not only can you do well on your boards, but you can be a more marketable general pediatrician. So let's start with the prevalence. So we can see that pediatric hypertension is seen in up to 4.5% of the population. And the number of children with prehypertension is up to almost 16% of the population. So up to 20% of children are either prehypertensive or hypertensive. Now couple that with the fact that most general pediatricians feel somewhat uncomfortable handling this pathology, and you can see that there's a huge market opportunity. So when you're applying for jobs, your, your prospective employer is wondering if you're going to make uh, him or her a multiple of your salary. So if you can walk in with, uh, with special expertise that you're going to get from this lecture, you're going to be able to tell them that you can take care of a problem that up to 20% of the population has. So who are they going to hire? They're going to hire the person who says, I love kids. I'm a team player. I'm a people person. I'm a people person who, who doesn't have any special expertise or you who says the same things but also tells your employer that you can take care of a problem that up to 20% of, of kids have. So what does the guidelines say about who should be screened? So regardless of what you do uh, currently in your clinics, the guidelines say that all children greater than three years of age who are seen in a medical setting should have their blood pressure monitored. So what if the child is under three years of age? Well, there are a lot of cases where you want to measure their blood pressure as well. So I'll go through the list. The first is if the child is premature, very low birth weight, or spent time in the NICU. Also, if the patient has a history of congenital heart disease, whether the heart disease is repaired or unrepaired, uh, they're going to need their blood pressure monitored. Uh, if there's a history of recurrent UTI, hematuria, or proteinuria, if there's renal disease or any type of urologic malformations, if there's a family history of congenital renal disease, or if the patient has undergone, undergone a solid organ transplant, uh, if there's a malignancy, or if the patient has undergone a bone marrow transplant, if the child's been treated with drugs known to raise blood pressure, like steroids, if the patient has a systemic illness that's associated with hypertension, like neurofibromatosis or tuberous sclerosis, and if there's evidence of uh, elevated intracranial pressure. So all of these would require you to check a blood pressure in a child under three years of age. Okay, so what are some things that you need to know about how to measure blood pressure? First, auscultation is the preferred method. And that's because automated blood pressures tend to run higher. Um, realistically, you aren't going to be measuring all of the patient's blood pressures manually, but the guidelines are that any time there's a blood pressure greater than the 90th percentile, you need to repeat it by manual auscultation. So what's the definition of hypertension? And that exact question tends to appear on in-service exams and board exams. So specifically, you have to know that one elevated blood pressure does not make the diagnosis of hypertension. So you have to have three blood pressures, systolic and or diastolic, that are greater than or equal to the 95th percentile. And you have to know this part for sex, age, and height. So what about prehypertension? Prehypertension is an average systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure that's greater than or equal to the 90th percentile, but less than the 95th percentile. And adolescents with a blood pressure uh, greater than or equal to 120 over 80 are prehypertensive. Well, what about white coat hypertension? Uh, many times a patient will be hypertensive in our office, but normotensive throughout the day. And if that's the case, then you're dealing with white coat hypertension. An ambulatory blood pressure monitor can help to make that diagnosis. So questions on correct blood pressure cuff size appears on these exams. So you need to know that an appropriate cuff size is a cuff with an inflatable bladder width that's at least 40% of the arm circumference at a point midway between the olecranon and the acromion. 
And for such a cuff to be optimal for an arm, the cuff bladder length should cover 80 to 100% of the circumference of the arm. And this requirement requires that the bladder width to length ratio be at least one to two. So it's important to know that blood pressure measurements are overestimated to a greater degree with a cuff that's too small than they are underestimated by a cuff that's too large. Blood pressure standards based on sex, age, and height provide a precise classification of blood pressure according to body size. So the revised blood pressure tables now include the 50th, 90th, 95th, and 99th percentiles with standard deviations based on sex, age, and height. So let's define stage one hypertension and stage two hypertension. Stage one hypertension is a designation for blood pressure levels that range from the 95th percentile to five millimeters of mercury above the 99th percentile. And stage two hypertension is a designation for blood pressure levels that are higher than, the, than five millimeters of mercury above the 99th percentile. So in addition to helping you on these exams, if you want to bill yourself as a hypertension expert, then the rest of this lecture is going to be helpful for you. So I'm going to put up algorithms which you can easily utilize in your practice. And these tables are from the fourth report. And I encourage you to print them out and make them yours. So you can see that if the blood pressure is below the 90th percentile, then the patient is normotensive. And all you need to do is encourage healthy diet, sleep, and physical activity. If the blood pressure is from the 90th to the 95th percentile, then that qualifies as prehypertension. And you need to recheck their blood pressure in six months and cancel them uh, on their weight if that's an issue. And also encourage physical activity and make diet recommendations. A very important point that I want to highlight is that if there are diseases like chronic kidney disease, diabetes, heart failure, or LVH, then that's an indication for pharmacologic therapy. Many residents and even some attendings are not aware of this recommendation. Stage one hypertension is a blood pressure from the 95th to the 99th plus five millimeters of mercury. So if your patient has stage one hypertension, then you're gonna to need to recheck their blood pressure in one to two weeks or sooner if they're symptomatic. If the blood pressures are persistently elevated on two other occasions, then you need to either address it or refer within one month. For stage one hypertension, uh, you need to offer weight management counseling, encourage physical activity and diet management, but most importantly, you need to initiate pharmacologic therapy. And lastly, stage two hypertension is a systolic or diastolic blood pressure that's greater than the 99th percentile plus five millimeters of mercury. And you need to address this within one week if they're asymptomatic. Again, you are recommending weight management, physical activity, and proper diet, just like with all the others. And as with stage one hypertension, you're initiating pharmacologic therapy. So here we see indications to initiate antihypertensive drug therapy in cases where there's stage one hypertension. So in the next three slides, I broke down a table which gives some very important information. So you have here a guideline of exactly what tests to order based on certain blood pressure values. So for all patients with blood pressures greater than or equal to the 95th percentile, you're getting a history which should include sleep, family history, risk factors, diet, uh, family history, um, and you're also doing a physical exam. Lab tests that you're getting are BUN, creatinine, electrolytes, a UA and urine culture. Basically, you're trying to evaluate for renal issues. Uh, a CBC is indicated to evaluate for anemia, and a renal ultrasound is indicated to evaluate for congenital and acquired anomalies. So there's been some recent debate as to whether or not the lipid panel needs to be fasting, but you want to identify hyperlipidemia as particularly in overweight patients with a blood pressure at the 90th to 94th percentile and in all patients with blood pressures higher than that. If there's a family history of hypertension or cardiovascular disease or in children with uh, chronic renal disease, then a lipid panel is indicated as well. So if the history makes you question drug use, then a drug screen can be helpful. And if there's a history of loud, frequent snoring, uh, a sleep study can be very helpful. Uh, from my experience, um, these next two tests are extremely underutilized. Retinal exams and echocardiograms. Retinal exams and echocardiograms are indicated for patients with comorbid conditions like diabetes and kidney disease with blood pressures between the 90th and uh, 94th percentile, and all patients with blood pressure greater than 95th percentile. The reason for that is to identify target organ damage, which would manifest as LVH on the echo. And as we saw earlier, LVH is an indication to initiate pharmacologic therapy. 
Retinal vascular changes are also an indication to initiate pharmacologic therapy, but LVH is far more commonly seen than retinal issues. So if you're uncertain as to whether the patient has white coat hypertension, you can get an ambulatory blood pressure monitor. Uh, for patients with stage 1 or 2 hypertension, if there's a family history of severe hypertension, you should obtain a plasma renin looking for mineralocorticoid-related disease. And for patients with stage 1 or 2 hypertension, you need to obtain renovascular imaging, uh, plasma and urine steroid levels, and uh, plasma and urine catecholamines. So make sure you're aware of which renovascular studies your imaging department is best at, since it doesn't help to obtain a, a three-dimensional CT if the results are free frequently equivocal based on the level of comfort of radiology. So find out what they're good at and order that. So it's important to know that secondary hypertension is more common in children than in adults. And because of the strong correlation between obesity and hypertension, BMI needs to be calculated as part of the physical exam. One good thing about EMRs is that this is often done for us. It might be the only good thing about EMRs. <laughs> um, so finally, when a patient is hypertensive, it's advised to calculate BP in both arms and a leg. If you've ever had to take a blood pressure in a child, you know how hard it is to get accurate numbers. So I would recommend getting a right arm blood pressure and then any leg. And this is going to pick up about 99% of coarctations. If you want to improve your odds even further, then get a left arm blood pressure. But there's almost never a reason to obtain a four extremity blood pressure and if you've tried to, uh, to get a four extremity blood pressure you know the numbers are often all over the place so go for the right arm and any leg and then if you if the kid's not freaking out get another arm and then call it a day so the next two slides give some associated physical exam findings that are associated with certain pathologies. And I included it here because of some of the because some of the some of the buzz, buzzwords that you see here can show up on board exams. And here's some more buzzwords. So I really want to hammer this point home. Target organ abnormalities are very commonly associated with hypertension in children and adolescents. LVH on echo is more often seen than any other end organ damage. And that's why your pediatric patients with hypertension need to have their LV mass assessed at diagnosis and periodically thereafter with echocardiogram. Uh, the reason for that is the presence of LVH is an indication to initiate or intensify your pharmacologic therapy. So let's talk about treatment. So when we start medications, it's recommended to initiate treatment with a single drug. You can use uh, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. But it's much better to max out one drug than start the patient on low dosages of three different meds. Now the goal for antihypertensive treatment uh, should be reduction of blood pressure to less than the 95th percentile, unless concurrent conditions are present. In that case, blood pressure should be lowered to less than the 90th percentile. Severe symptomatic hypertension should be treated with IV antihypertensive drugs. So another important point uh, that I want to make is that family-based intervention improves success. I'm a huge believer that, uh, you know, if there's a chocolate cake in the fridge next to a plate of celery, uh, when I'm hungry, I'm going for the chocolate cake 10 out of 10 times. And it's, it's human nature. So if the entire family is eating chicken fried steak and they turn to their kid and tell them, uh, hey, you're going to eat carrots, it's just not going to work. So you want to encourage the entire family to get the high calorie items out of the house. So go for uh, family based therapy. So in these next uh, three slides, uh, I've included basically a list of antihypertensive drugs for outpatient management. Um, so you can also find them in the fourth report because they're probably going to appear to be too small. So this last slide, um, you can see some antihypertensive drugs for the management of severe hypertension. And I think it's important to be comfortable with a few of these drugs. I'm, I'm personally a big fan of Esmolol uh, due to the fact that it's very short acting. So if there's uh, an adverse reaction, you can discontinue it and, and you're home free. Um, but you should have a couple of uh, drugs that you feel comfortable with in case you have a patient come in with uh, severe hypertension. Well, thank you very much for your attention and best of luck on your exams.